particular setting is going to be synchronization. That's to say, let's all set our watches for the attack. All right? Because you have to work together to get something done if you're servants of the Lord. And he has many people going in different directions, but you must go by the one sign, and that's God's sign. He tells you when. He tells you how. And probably one of the things that pulls more people off is when you start listening to one verse revs or people that don't know what they're talking about, trying to translate prophecy, and they'll say, watch, watch the United Nations. That's the beast. Okay. <clears throat> watch the big computer in Belgium. That's the beast. Where is, where is there any foundation for nonsense? There isn't. We have some people who would even publish something like, America is really Babylon. Well, yeah, if you would listen to someone like that, you'd listen to anything. You can be had, friends. Well, how do you prevent that? You stick to God's word. All prophecy concerning the end time centers on Jerusalem. Don't ever forget it, and you'll, you won't be led astray. Jerusalem is the barometer of the end times. It's not Rome. Anyone that would listen to that has been had. The Bible all the teachings of Christ concerning prophecy points to Jerusalem. So get that set in your mind and let it sink in real good. That basically is what this particular lecture is about, Jerusalem, and how it applies. Jerusalem has been occupied up till the year of 1948 for a 1,300-year period by one particular people. That's a long time. But there was a change, and there hasn't been a day the same since. The fig tree, both the evil and the good, were the plant, the shoot, was set out in Jerusalem. So don't, don't, don't uh, get your eyes too far away from it when it comes to prophecy. Open your Bibles to Luke. We ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Open your Bibles to Luke chapter 4. And this is going to be ever so simple, but for lectures that are going to follow, I want you all at least to be on, I want you to have your watches set. That is to say, where we're on the same page so that we know what our Father is relating to us. Okay, let's pick it up if we may. Jesus, incidentally, has, at, in this fourth chapter, has just been tempted by Satan. And Satan does that to you every day if you give him the opportunity. So that falls in place, and especially as you begin to serve God with a closer walk. He's going to tempt you more so. You must work as a unit. You cannot, you know, uh, destroyers are Satan's little children. They like to destroy the work of God. And maybe they do it as Jesus would warn you in the name of God. So as Satan has quoted scripture to pull people off, and in this case, even attempting to pull off course, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So what, why do you think you would frighten him as far as thinking you were tough to pull off course? So he's, he's going to try you with ever seemingly wonderful, great swelling words. Stick to the word of God. Stay focused. But that's so simple. That's because God loves you. He wants it kept simple so that we can all be on the same page, so that we conquer Satan and have the victory. Chapter 4, verse 17, and it reads... And there was delivered unto him, being Christ, the book of the prophet Isaiah, that's to say Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me 
to preach the gospel to the poor, that's to say to the humble. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. That's to say those that know better, that know something is wrong and it breaks their heart to see people misled. To preach deliverance to the captives. Those that Satan might have wrapped up the whole families in some cases to teach you how to break free of that. To teach you how to be a servant of the living God. And recovering the sight to the blind, that is to say blind to the truth, in many cases whereby they could see that light, see that truth. And recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised. Bruised for what? Bruised for serving God. Just because you serve the Lord and because you plant seeds occasionally, you're going to get bruised a little bit for it. You're going to have some knucklehead that will come along and try to draw you off course or have his own agenda. Not God's agenda. God didn't send any heroes or special people. We're one body. This is what is special is the word of God. And a person that is not in it just isn't with God, period. Okay? But to wound those that are bruised or that suffer, what, what does that mean? It means he's going to take care of you. That was his first advent, and that's what we're talking about here. And then he says, verse 19, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, comma. Now he stopped in the middle of a verse. Now, Satan had just been quoting a lot of verses, and I know you that have studied with me, you know what the rest of that verse is. And you know why he stopped right there. Because that's setting your watch. That's letting you know where you are, what he is talking about. Why? So that you're not deceived. He's talking about the first advent. Verse 20, and he closed the book and he gave it to, uh, again to the minister and he sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day, set your watch, friend, in your mind. This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. That's the first part. Now we got part number two. And you're very much involved in that part number two. And that's why it's important that you pay attention to God's word because there are prophecies unfolding daily. And you have to know where to look to see them. Not through another man's eyes, but through your own eyes. Because Christ came the first time to open your eyes to what's happening. Whereby you are not blind to it. Whereby you are not deceived. That you're a child of his able to function as a servant of the living God. Verse 22, and all bear him witness. They listened and wondered at the glorious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? Now many of you, when you learn a truth, you mention it in your family. And they, well, you surely don't believe that. Well, it's written right here in the Bible. Well, you surely don't believe that. That's pretty dangerous stuff, friend. When people will not see what is plainly and simply written on the pages of God's Word, of exactly how it's going down in the end generation. It's not going to be nice when your family doesn't listen to you. But should you cry a lot about that? Let's see what happened to Christ about this. And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy community. In other words, Christ had quite a reputation at this time for healing the sick and so on and so forth for teaching the word. They didn't believe it. I mean, there's any way you want to put it, they're challenging him. Show us a sign. And that, that's the cry of so many people when he has given you the whole book. And you would ask for a sign. The thing you need to do is familiarize yourself with what the signs are. 
and read them for yourself. That's why we're here, verse 24. And he said, verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. So many of you, I, I know you have problems with some of your own families. Well, do you think you're better than Christ? You think you can tell it better than he did? Naturally, you're gonna have some problems. That in itself ultimately works to the positive as it is written in Mark 13 for your own family deliver you because they think the false Jesus is indeed Jesus. Why? A bunch of yo-yos told them. Don't listen to yo-yos. Listen to the word of God. Verse 25. But I tell you of a truth, Christ speaking. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, the same equivalent of time of the final days, so to speak. To give an example, he's drawing and using the analogy. When great famine was throughout all the land, and you know what the great famine is today? It's for people really hearing the true word of God, not bread. Amos chapter 8, verse 11 documents that. Verse 26, And unto none of them was Elias, was Elijah sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. What made this widow different then? Well, for one thing, she, was will she only had enough for her and her son, one meal and then they were going to die, she was willing to share that with a man of God. Okay? And, of course, he blessed her. God blessed her through that one. Why did God pick her? Because the son and her was a sign unto you. Verse 27, And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, which is the Greek for Elisha, uh, the servant of Elijah, the prophet. And none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. What? He wasn't even of the house of Israel. And old Naaman just almost missed it. You know why? As it is written in 2 Kings, the prophet told him, hey, go out there and dip seven times in the water. He said, here I come all this way and brought him all these goods. And that's going to heal me. You see, it's obedience. And it's the word. So he finally went, he dipped himself seven times and he was white as a newborn child. That is to say of leprosy, cleansed of leprosy. The scaly uh, substances were gone. Why? He obeyed God. Did God do that for everyone? No. Well, why did he do it for him? Because he finally mustered the faith to go dip seven times. It's much like as some of you you, you do what many so-called healers do not do in this generation. The word is very clear that you are to anoint with the oil of our people. They've spit on them and blow on them and kick them and shove them and have men catch them and roll them. You know, and I'm not, so help me God, I'm making, not making fun of them, but it is kind of funny, isn't it? Yeah. Really, you know. You're supposed to anoint them and let God do the rest, okay? That's his promise, and he will do it. And so help me God, I'm, I'm not, I like all our dear brethren of the cloth and so forth, I think, and whatever, but it's just not biblical. Do I think they're healing anyone? Not really, because no man heals unless he practices the art. God does the healing. Man likes to kind of take himself out for something he is not, if you're not careful, okay? We serve God. So there we have the Lord Jesus Christ immediately after being tempted by Satan, giving the time period of that time. Time is very important. And he wants us to set our minds, our, the clocks of our mind prophetically, to that uh, particular time. Now turn with me to Luke 21. Now as I said, this is basically 
to synchronize our minds for what's about to follow. That may I know you've been over it, but pay attention. Or about tonight or tomorrow night, you're, uh, tomorrow afternoon, you're going to wonder which way the herd went. Okay, synchronize yourselves. Chapter twenty-one, and and um, what has happened here? You're all familiar with it. This is where God's elect are delivered up. They're not to premeditate what they will say beforehand, but what you are given at that time by the Holy Spirit, speak. And Jesus, in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and here, gave seven signs, which are the seven trumpets. You don't have to worry about it. They're here. They're written. I guess the question is, have we read it with understanding? Verse uh, 19, a very bit of wise information, advice. In your patience possess you your souls. Be patient. Cover God's word. And give, God has patience. You must have patience. It's very difficult to be patient when you see such exciting prophecy transpiring around this world. But be patient. Our time is not yet. Set your clock. 20. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, now this is a sign for you. When you'll see it compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. That means the desolator is on his way. Well, who is he? Satan. The same Satan that tempted Christ in the wilderness is on his way back again. I guess the question is, are you locked and loaded for him? Okay, verse 21, then, well, what am I to do? Then, let them which are in Judea, well, where's that? Jerusalem, look at it, face it. Don't let some numbskull pull you off track. All prophecy points to the barometer of prophecy, Judea, Jerusalem. Uh, Judea, flee to the mountains and let them which are in the midst of it, where? Jerusalem. Depart out and let not them that are in the countries enter thereunto. In other words, it's going to get rough. Why? The desolator's coming. 22. For these be the days. Well, what days is that? These be the days of vengeance. That all things which are written may be fulfilled. Do you know what they are? Okay. Well, that, that makes it very important. Quite frankly, that's the rest of the scripture that Jesus didn't read. Why? It wasn't the day of vengeance. But bless your hearts, listen, it is so close upon us now that you better be on guard. You'd better be alert. God's not going to put up with this stuff forever. You understand? I said, your father is not going to put up with this stuff that's going on in the world forever. He will not be mocked. 20, uh, well, let's read the 23rd verse. But woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. What's that wrath? And that sounds kind of frightening. Not if you're a child of God. The wrath goes to the enemy. The wrath goes to Satan. Is that who you're of? Well, if you are, you're in the wrong place, friend. God loves his children. His wrath is not appointed at them, and it does come on the day of vengeance. That's what it amounts to. But his touch to you is not wrath, but a gentle glow that is called the Holy Spirit. And that touch anoints you, whereby you can better even understand the Word of God, His direction. So, it's important that you take that sign. Well, I wish he would show me. He has. Listen to me. When you see Jerusalem encompassed, I hope you're watching. I hope you're keeping up. I hope some nut hadn't pulled you off over in some boom-boom land somewhere and you've taken your eyes off the barometer. That would mean you hadn't been studying God's word. You hadn't remained focused on where the action that is the sign takes place. You would not recognize it as it transpires before your very eyes. And listen to me closely. God's elect have a very important role 
to play within this. That's why it is so important. But it's so simple. That's right. He wants to make sure you understand because things that are really, really difficult, we just have trouble understanding, don't we? But God teaches in simplicity. And he's a realist. And some people get too boom-boomy and overlook what's happening before their very eyes. Oh, if I could only be sure, they say. Well, God's warned us. He gave us the sign. There it is. And we'll be talking a great deal more about that statement, that verse that we just read before this weekend is over. But for the time being, what, what did Jesus leave out of that uh, scripture he read? They handed him the book of Isaiah, and he was reading from Isaiah 61. Turn there with me if you, I'm sorry, going to make another stop in the New Testament. I want to go to first, Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians, just for a quick uh, rest stop, okay? For knowledge. So that we get a, this day of vengeance, I want to nail it. I want you to see the signs of it. The Pauline doctrine is no different than the Gospels. That's what I want you to know. Well, maybe Paul taught something different. No, he didn't. So stay focused. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God? This is to say, well, let's back up to 4 so we get the whole thought. So that we ourselves glory in you, the churches of God. We'll be talking more about the churches of God. That simply means the assemblies that truly love God and worship and study with him. For your patience and faith in your persecutions. You're going to be persecuted. So what? Satan can't kick up enough dust that I can't get his name and kick his dragon before he gets turned around twice because Christ has given us that power. Okay? People worry too much. He that created all things gives us powers. Have you used it or do you just talk about it? I don't like to talk about it. I like action. And tribulations that ye endure. What are those tribulations? What does it mean? When, when I have to, maybe somebody say, you surely don't believe that. That could not be true or something like that. It hurts your feelings in the spiritual sense. What does it actually mean though? Verse 5. Which is a manifest token. It's plain evidence of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. I mean, naturally, I mean, don't, don't be blind. Satan has been given a little space in this world to fool a few people if they'll listen to him. He's kind of in charge here. Do you think he's going to let you come down here and mess up his playhouse without squirming a little bit? Of course he's not. Don't be a dreamer. Naturally, he's going to, but why would you worry about it? You don't have to. God gave you power over all your enemies, including him. You don't have to tolerate it. Why? Do you think God doesn't know what's going on in your life today? Do you think he doesn't? If you're really working for him, he knows. Why? Listen. Six. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense Tribulation to them that trouble you. Oh, can he dish it out? Do you think he waits until the wrath spills over? Not if they touch you. They're going to get it. That's why you can almost pray for your enemies because they are going to get it. Seven, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. Relax, ease your pack down. I should have started to say light them up if you got them, but I guess that's not. We can't say that. That's an old military. Relax, all right? When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. It's going to happen, beloved. Listen to me. It's going to happen in this generation. Well, what day? Nobody knows the day. But 
He's giving you the sign so that you can set your clock, so that you know the seasons. Have you read it? Verse 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, you, you play, you pay, friend. Don't you think that God doesn't keep good records? They're perfect. Not like something we might keep. And those that will mock God, I feel sorry for them. But they made their own bed. Let them sleep in it. All you're responsible for is to plant seeds. If they insist on letting that seed rot under a clod, let it. Or let them put it to use and produce fruit for Almighty God. And have a family that is blessed. That's, that's, that's our choice. That's each one of our choices is to choose which, whether we want God's blessings and protection or whether we want to play and disregard the Gospels. Verse 9. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power? Listen. Only God's elect are allowed around the throne. They're called the princes in the millennium. And their their lot is by the Father. Some people will pay forever and ever. Well, I'm going to repent at the last minute. Oh, you poor misled sucker. Verse 10. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints... And to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Did it say you should believe John Doe or Jim Fodderbust or something? No, it said our word, God's word. He didn't say you should believe Arnold Murray or somebody else. He said believe our word, which is God's word. And um, verse 11, wherefore... Also, we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. I don't know. Do you have the power? Uh, Beloved, that's a serious question. If you just read and kind of say, well, that's nice. No, exercise it. Well, I wish I didn't feel so bad. Use the power. Just don't, don't, be a, don't be an old dragon do-nothing in your own life. Well, I pray for other people, but I don't pray for myself. Well, suffer. Suffer. I, I, it's difficult for me to see, and un, well, anyway, verse 12. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you. Beloved, that's a wonderful purpose. Can someone look at you and the Lord Jesus Christ is glorified in your life? The example you set. I know there's none of us perfect. Lord only knows. Uh, We all fall short. And ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. What What a wonderful calling you do have. And it is a calling. And there's not one of you that hasn't known basically since you were a child there was more to God's word. And that you were a part of it. And we're closing in on that time that that part must be played, must come to, to uh, fulfillment. And it shall. Now turn with me to Isaiah chapter 61. I just wanted to nail that day of vengeance. That's kind of our topic with the city being encompassed. <clears throat> Let's go back and see what Jesus was truly talking about in Isaiah 61 so we can better understand, so we can get a grip on the sign of that particular day. And it's important that all Christians recognize that particular day. And let's go with 61. Let's pick it up with verse 1, and it reads, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. These are the words Jesus spoke in Luke chapter 4. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, and that's to say the humble, to have sent, he hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, 
That's those that it breaks their heart to see Satan take advantage of their family. To proclaim liberty to the captives, to show them how to free themselves, and to the opening of the prison to them that are bound, bound in the traditions of this world, set you free into the truth. No flyaway doctrine, but to be an able working servant for the living God. Two, to proclaim. This was the, what is proclaim? It means to make known. I mean, don't just think about it. Say it out loud. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. There's where he stopped. Now, what's the rest of that? Because that's the part that's important to you today. And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. In other words, it was very important to him as Messiah to make both days known. To proclaim both of them the day of vengeance and that's why he would say in Luke chapter 21 when you see Jerusalem Judea encompassed well now you know 1300 years and there were squabbles yeah all families have squabbles but there there really wasn't any wars that you know really were endangered the city it wasn't surrounded and then bingo, all of a sudden in 1948, how many days of peace have there been since that time? How many body parts did they pick up today? Peace, peace, peace. And what? There is no peace there. Got to watch. He wants to proclaim that day. Hey, he's getting, our father's getting tired of it. You do not mock God. Well, let's see what else he says. To appoint to, unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes. Well, that sounds good, doesn't it? The oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Do you take it from that, that as that day of vengeance, of vengeance approaches, that he intended for you to be a sad sack? Hmm? I don't think so. It should be a joyous occasion for you. It means our Redeemer draweth nigh. It means that we have work to do. It means that we can, you can put off that that Satan maybe tried to put on you and your family and be joyous. We've got something to celebrate. And that's that our Father loves us and that he gives us the time. He gives us the signs. If we pay attention to him and watch the place he tells us to watch. Verse 4. And they shall build the old waste and shall raise up the former desolations and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. In other words, after a long period of time, and strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the alien shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. Let me ask you a question. What are we going to be planting and growing and sowing in the millennium? Truth. It means that all people, kings and queens of the ethnos, which are election, are going to be planting, teaching, and working the fields to save God's children, as many as can be, pull forth from those ashes. Uh, verse 6, but you shall be named the priest of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God, not Satan. You shall eat the riches of the nations, may I properly translate. And in their glory shall you boast yourselves. It will be something to take joy in to be happy about, is to save, miss you see, many of you have planted seeds recently and they were snuffed at. But when they see you standing with the Lord, they're gonna say, whoa, I should have listened. That's important. You see, a prophet must always declare before the event or he or she is no prophet or prophetess. Therefore, when you plant seeds, you're not wasting time, whether it's received or not. There's a day coming very soon. They're going to know that you know what you're talking about. Why? You listen to some man? No. 
You listen to the word of God. Verse 7. For your shame you shall have double. You think you can outgive God in, in love and caring? No. He doubles up on you when you it makes his day. It makes him so happy when you stand with him. And for con- confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. What a beautiful thought. You know, is it worth it, friend? Is it worth it to go through this age putting up with people that will not receive the truth to have double joy forever? I think so. My word, this is just a drop in the bucket, friend. Don't, you know, if you're already getting tired and discouraged, you haven't seen anything yet. You, you, you got to plug into the right socket, friend, to, to recharge your battery, to get power. And that's the, our Heavenly Father, to understand how much He loves you. Now, let's just think on this just a moment. What has He done here? He's given you the time it will happen. He's told you what to look for. He's told you how to spot it, how to see it, and what's in it for you, double portion. That's always a first fruit offering. Verse 8, for I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery of burnt offerings. I hate people that play church, okay, just to receive a few offerings. That's what he's saying. And I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. No more going out, friend. But that covenant is for you today. Latch on to it. Hang on to it. It's a contract. It's a marriage contract between you and the Lamb. Nine, and their seed shall be known among the Gentiles and their offspring. Translate it to nations everywhere as an example, a good example. And their offspring among the people, all that see them shall acknowledge them. Can't help it. That they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. It will be, why? Well, how will they be that outstanding? Because they... They're right by the Father. They're double blessed. Why couldn't you spot one of them? And they all have compassion for those that are lost. They have compassion on their brothers and sisters that need help in learning truth. You want to be real careful in this generation. You get some brothers and sisters that It seems like the only help they want from you is what you got in your pocket. And oftentimes, many times, you become a party to their evil deeds for being a provider or an enabler to help them in their own shortcomings. Oh, but they're so sweet. Be careful, friend. Be very careful. Tough love is hard, but it's real love. It lasts. Verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh herself with ornaments, uh, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. I mean, the wedding is set. You're going to be there. Of course you are. And it's not that bad, you know. It, um, if, you know, there's going to be problems, but hey, what, you know, it's just good exercise for a real soldier of God to have a little war with Satan anytime, you know, it's to be, you know, it's just good exercise. It's good mind exercise to be able to overcome someone that's of another camp or another way. It's just, it's just neat, all right? Don't, don't look at it as trouble. Look at it as, a, as a, your blessing then. Chapter 35, the wild, verse 1. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. Boy, that hadn't happened yet, but it's going to. When? That is the day of vengeance. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon. Those are gardens, okay? It means just really lush, plush. 
uh, they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Everything about him is excellent. Everything about him is fair. Well, he was so hard on those people. Hey, they had it coming. That's fair, okay? When you play, you pay. Period. That's it, all right? But he is excellent, totally fair in judgment. He, gets, he, he makes sure that a person gets everything they got coming to them all in one day. I don't know what's, what's in the book for you. It's something to think about, friend. I say that not to frighten you, but I want you to be on the side that has double everything, all right? Be strengthened, ye the weak hands, and confirm the feeble knees. Comfort with the good news. That's what he's saying here. Comfort your family. Comfort those that will listen. Don't, make a, don't become a religious fanatic or make a fool out of yourself, but comfort. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong. Fear not, because your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense, he will come and save you. Now, does that have cause you any worry or something you should worry about? He's coming, all right with vengeance and with wrath. But what was his purpose concerning you? To save you, all right? To kick them off your back. And then, you know, it's kind of like when they're down and out and gone all the way to the devil, maybe they'll listen through the millennium. You know, we're sure gonna try and uh, we're gonna see what happens there, but it still always comes back to one point. It's between each entity and our Father himself. They make their own bed, guess what? They sleep in it. That's the way it goes. You make your bed, you sleep in it. That day of vengeance is coming. Well, how are we supposed to know? He told us. He gave us the geographical location to observe. And he said, be patient. What does that mean? It means you don't have to worry about a thing. When you're supposed to know, he will tell you. But you've got to watch, and you can't be made a fool of. You can't play the fool. You, do you know what happens if you listen to a fool? You become a bigger fool than he is, all right? So, well, how do I prevent that? Stay in God's word. Stay focused. It's going down exactly the way it is written. Five, for the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Who's going to do that? The Lord Jesus Christ, all right? That's a change of bodies. There's not going to be any, um, any uh, well, verse six. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, like a deer. Okay? A man that had no legs at all in the flesh body is going to run and jump fences like a deer. Well, I don't know about jumping fences, but maybe there won't even be any fences there, hopefully, but... And the tongue of the dumb sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. Christ is going to do that whenever he touches that moment at the seventh trump and we're all changed into our spiritual bodies. No aches, no pains, everything on the up. And guess what? Some of you get double. Boy, it's something to think about. And the parched ground shall become a pool. I mean, there's going to be water, life. And the thirsty land springs of water in the habitation of dragons. Um, in, the hab in the habitation of dragons, where each day shall be grass with reeds and rushes. That, the dragon is our enemy, of course. Where he was, there's going to be nothing but peace. And in highway shall be there in a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. In other words, why will fools not err therein? There's not going to be any. They're gone. They're not allowed on that road. That's why it's so important that we plant seeds as we do to save all that can. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there. 
but the redeemed shall walk there. Why? In the flesh body, the lion, a child could play with one. They're a pet. God loves animals. We'll document that. Well, go back to Isaiah chapter 11 and read it for yourself. Different time, different subject. 10. And the ransomed, who's that? The elect of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads and shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. There's just not going to be any tears, not going to be any sorrow. Because at the end of the millennium, when this total restoration takes place, there's some, there's going to be another way besides this one. Do you know what that way is? It's a swimming pool. And it's hot. It's, it's one of those hot tubs that, I mean, that sucker is really hot. It's called the lake of fire. And they're going to walk that walk. And hey, but everyone that walks it will fairly have been judged, will have had every opportunity to be as you, to change as you, or they would have from day one. Let's put it that way. It's a little late for one of those to have the same opportunities for those that were chosen before the foundations of the world. But God still loves his children. Okay, I want to go to one more place. And I want you to remember something very carefully. Go to the last book in the Old Testament. I want to read you something special, and we'll be touching on this again uh, Sunday afternoon. So remember this prophecy. Malachi. Do you know what Malachi means? It means messenger. God's living word is a message to you. Chapter 4, verse 1 of Malachi, last book in the Old Testament. Listen to it very carefully, this first verse. For behold, the day cometh, it's going to, that will burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Do you know that's never happened before? That didn't happen at the close of the first earth age. There is a special ingredient involved within that statement. And I, I will bring that right to the surface for you. I just want you to make a mental note of it. I'll be calling on it again, or you will mentally. Verse 2. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness... Arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Which, which means you're not going to be pinned anymore in stalls. You're going to be free. Free to go wherever you so choose. This is a terrible day he's talking about here for the wicked. Do you understand? It's the day of vengeance. And ye shall tread down the wicked. Now wait a minute. God's elect are going to do What? I, what I want you to know is there's a part that some feel they've escaped, that you have a part in. Let's read it again. And you shall tread down the wicked, and they shall be ashes under the soles of your, I repeat, your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Oh, man. I thought all I had to do is plant seeds. That is. But the day of vengeance is coming, and you're a part of it. God didn't say, I'm the one that's going to do this. Not all of it. So let that, just make a mental note of that in passing. We'll come back to it, not to the verse, but you'll understand Sunday afternoon. Verse 4, remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb, for all, Israel, for, for all Israel, for how, how much? All. With the statutes and judgments. It's still there, still applies. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. 
Do you know, Elijah never died. So he will never be born of a woman as we all have been. You know, he, God took him off in a fancy vehicle. I, boy, I'd like to fly that sucker. Woo! Mm-mm-mm. It'd be fun, wouldn't it? Zip, zap. There's things we don't know. I don't think you could ride it in a flesh body. I will say that much. It would transfigured fine. Anyway, uh, be prepared. God has me- that messenger. John the Baptist only came in the spirit of Elijah. Elijah did not come. John the Baptist was born of Elizabeth. He was a flesh man. And so is Elijah, quite frankly. But he wasn't born of a woman. Originally, he was born of a woman. Don't, I've got to be careful here. I'm saying reborn. That don't happen, all right? So many might say, well, I think I'm Elijah. I'm sorry. We've already got one, all right? He's with the Father. And the Father promises he's coming back, all right? So, so don't listen to goofballs and nutheads, all right, that try to make them something that God only knows. I guess they need something in their life, maybe. I don't know. But anyway, uh, we have him. But you are kind of in that ministry that does change the hearts of the children to the Father's plural. You're going to drive them to the devil, or to God, one or the other. You always make sure you leave the choice to them. All right? Let them pick their own course. It isn't nice to tell somebody to go to hell. <laughs> Very often. You have to. <laughs> you, you, you might suggest if they're not careful, they might be getting a ticket, okay? Or something of that nature. Uh, in closing, back up to chapter 3, Malachi, this is beautiful because Malachi, meaning messenger, there's a special message for you. Verse 1, chapter 3, Malachi. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Not maybe, not perhaps. And you would be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. God has sent you a message. He has given you the word. He's given you power over all of your enemies. What in the world else would you want other than that loving, touching hand of Almighty God? I guess the question is, do you exercise it? Exercise your power and authority over evil. Something evil comes around your home, don't, don't pet it. I mean, kick it out. Do not put up with it. Anoint your home and tell Satan where to go. It's all right to tell him to go to hell because he's already got a ticket. All right? Verse 2. But who may abide in the day of his coming? You can. You can. It's not going to burn you at all but it's going to touch you. It's going to be wonderful. And who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. I want you to make a mental note of that. Fire is a very cleansing thing, and everything you've ever done is going to be tested as fire that you have not repented of if it be evil. If it's good, even your righteous acts are going to be tested as fire. I mean, like if your righteous acts are silver or gold, hey, Fire can't hurt it. You're in good standing. So it's going to happen. But boy, is it bad if you're wicked. If you're one of these that would say, oh, God doesn't notice me. Oh, he's your father. You're the only one like you he's got. The only one that's got your particular DNA or your fingerprints. You're special to him. Act like it, all right? Um, Verse 3, he shall sit as the refiner and purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi, purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasing unto the Lord as in the days of old and in the former. 
Do you know what's going to happen to some? No, listen carefully. Verse 5 to conclude. And I will come near to you to judgment. And that's good, beloved, because you know what judgment is to you with righteous acts? It's reward, payday, all right? And to those that have got about a, a, a bunch of dirty laundry, payday also, all right? You get everything you got coming to you in one day, bang. And I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against the false swearers, those that would say they're teaching my word and are not, and against those that oppress or defraud the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and that fear not me. That's to say, loves not me, saith the Lord of hosts. Our Father, really, even though he is the creator of all things, and is the father of every soul that has ever lived. He's really pretty easy to please. He's really very easy to please. All you have to do is try and seek his guidance. He will give it. He will lead you and love you. Now, what was my point in this particular lecture? I want you to watch Jerusalem. All prophecy concerning the end, the day of vengeance, hinges on Jerusalem. Don't let some idiot pull you off track and have you gazing off somewhere else. I, I might say Jesus would say it better than I in Mark 13 when they would say, hey, if they tell you he's out in the desert, if they tell you he's out there behind them boonies over there or something like that, don't you believe it. Why? He'd already told you it's going to be in Judea. So it's important that you let that settle into your mind, especially now. And that was the point, is that the day of vengeance is fast approaching. We're at, um, and there are so many teachings that I felt it necessary to teach a message strictly on focus on prophecy and watch where the if Jesus said it's Judea, if Jesus said it's Jerusalem, why would you look somewhere else? I mean, they're writing books, idiot sheets, about what this is going to happen and that's going to happen and something, but it has nothing, no, rec no uh, semblance to God's word. I don't like to see people deceived. Simply observe God's word. Where he says it's going to happen, friend, you can count on it. And I'm going to tell you something. When you don't focus, do you know what happens? You look away, you get sidetracked. There's a whole lot going to go on you're not going to know about. And there could be a day coming when that could be very harmful to you to miss a sign, to not be prepared spiritually and mentally for what's going down at that time. Because you just, if you're not familiar with the Father's word, you just don't know what to look for. Or what is your duty in this? We've touched on that. Let me assure you, you do have a duty. We'll be talking more about that tonight. Don't miss the two churches.